All right, I don't know if people can hear me. I am setting up. Um, things changed. Facebook changed how they did things. YouTube changed how they did things and left me scrambling. So hopefully there's people. All right, let's see. Here's an explosion that you can make. Want to know how? Then keep watching. Hello, young neighbors. Welcome to Junior Science. Today, we're going to talk about automobiles. We're going to open them up, look inside, and find out what makes them go. Now, the inside of an automobile looks very complicated. But actually, you can show yourself how an automobile works by doing a few simple scientific experiments. Now, we all know that an automobile runs on gasoline. In the automobile, the gasoline is mixed with air and exploded. Here's an experiment which will show you that a mixture of gasoline and air is explosive. Let's fill a clay pipe with absorbent cotton. Now, let's put gasoline until the cotton becomes well soaked. Then let's dip the pipe in some soap suds and blow a bubble. Now, watch what happens when we touch the soap bubble with a lighted candle. So we know that a mixture of gasoline and air explodes when a flame touches it. In an automobile, the gasoline is mixed with air in this part, which is called the carburetor. And here's an experiment you can do to show yourself how the carburetor does it. Cut a soda straw in half. Now stand one half in a glass of water. Hold the end of the other straw next to it. Now if you blow hard across the top of the standing straw, the water will climb up the straw, mix with air, and shoot out in a fine spray. Why does the water go up when you blow? Because moving air has less pressure than still air. When you blow across the straw, ordinary air pressure on the water in the glass pushes it up toward the tip of the straw, where the air has less pressure because you are blowing across it. And that's how gasoline is mixed with air in the carburetor of an automobile. In the carburetor, Air must pass through this narrow tube on its way to the engine. This tight squeeze makes the air speed up, and it pulls drops of gasoline from this tank. And now, let's see what happens in the engine of an automobile. An automobile engine is made up of six or eight round, hollow tubes called cylinders. This is what a cylinder looks like and this is a piston, which moves up and down inside. Now, in each cylinder, there are four movements, or strokes, and these movements are repeated over and over. The first stroke is called intake. 
In this stroke, the intake valve opens, the piston moves down, and a mixture of gasoline and air is sucked into the cylinder. Now, the mixture of gasoline and air can be exploded just the way it is, but we get more power out of it if we compress it before we explode it. So the second stroke in each cylinder is compression. And now we're ready for the really important stroke of our gas engine, the power stroke. When the piston is ready for the power stroke, a spark jumps across the spark plug and explodes the gasoline and air mixture. The explosion pushes the piston down with tremendous force. Now, there is an exciting experiment that you can do right in your own home to show how this power stroke works. But you must do this experiment exactly as we're going to do it now because otherwise it can be very dangerous. Instead of the cylinder, we use a coffee can with a small hole punched near the bottom. In place of the piston, we use the cover of the can. And in place of the spark plug, a match. We fill a medicine dropper with gasoline and cover the gasoline bottle and put it at least 20 feet away from where we're doing the experiment, or better still, in another room. Now we measure five drops of gasoline into the can. No more, because more is very dangerous. We cover the can and put a candle under it to vaporize the gasoline. And now for the power stroke. Are you ready? Here we go. We attach a match to a long pencil with a rubber band. Light the match. And holding the far end of the pencil, put the match in the hole. The match acts as a spark plug and explodes the mixture of gasoline and air. Well, that's what happens over and over again in every automobile at the power stroke. The gasoline and air mixture explodes. Now the engine is ready for its last stroke. To prepare the cylinder for the next intake stroke, the exhaust valve at the top opens. The piston moves up and pushes out the burnt gases. The burnt gases must be pushed out of the cylinder because if they were not, they would keep the next batch of gasoline and air from burning properly. If you want to see that this would happen, just do this. Fit a wire handle on a jar top and put a candle in the top. Light the candle. And lower it to the bottom of a tall glass. Cover the glass with a piece of cardboard. Soon the candle burns up all the oxygen in the glass and goes out. As soon as the candle goes out, slide off the cover and lower a burning match into the glass. Now clear the burnt air from the glass by pulling out the jar top in the same way that the piston in the automobile engine pushes out burnt gases on the exhaust stroke. Now when you put in a burning match, it stays lit. So we see that each cylinder of a gas engine in an automobile has four strokes. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. And these four strokes are repeated over and over again, many times a minute. The force obtained from the movement of the pistons up and down in the cylinders is used to turn a shaft which transmits the force to the wheels. And that's what drives an automobile. Now, when the engine of an automobile is running, it gets very hot. So hot that parts of it would melt if it were not cooled. To cool the engine, water is pumped through a jacket that surrounds the cylinders.
How does plain water cool a very hot automobile engine? Here's an experiment you can do that will show you how it can. If you take a paper cup and put it over a flame, the cup catches fire. But now, with another paper cup, pour in about a quarter of a cup of water. Hold the cup over a candle flame and the water soon starts to boil. And yet the paper cup does not burn. The reason is that the water, even though it is hot, carries off enough heat from the cup so that the paper does not get hot enough to burn. In an automobile engine, water removes heat from the cylinders in the same way. It carries the heat to the radiator where it releases it to the air. And now you know a great deal about how automobile engines work. All right, here we go. My apologies for getting started late. Um, so YouTube and Facebook both changed how they do streaming um, from the last time I did this, like a month ago. So I had to figure out where everything was and how it was gonna work. So there you go. Anyhow, hi. Wait. Hi, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Uh, welcome. Make this a little bit more whatever. Okay, I'm going to take my glasses off too. How about that? There you go. So I don't see the reflection of, the, of myself in them. Um, I'm Skip Alzheimer uh, of AV Geeks. I uh, have collected tens of thousands of 16 millimeter educational films and I show them to folks like you um, at shows, on DVDs, uh, I have s several thousand films online at different places and I've helped other archives put their stuff online, so, um, hi, uh, this is my chance to say hi to everybody, um, via Facebook and YouTube, please feel free to comment, um, etc. Tonight's, uh, theme came to me, uh, surprisingly, I have a lot of films about gasoline, or about service stations, or about uh, petroleum. Um, lots and lots of them. I could do many hours of stuff. So I picked the creme de la creme. Um, I was joking that this, I don't know if I could ever do a show out in public about gasoline, unless it was like at a refinery plant or something like that. But I could do whatever I want here, because here I am at the archive, and I'm streaming to you. Uh, and you didn't have to like come out and pay admission and sit and watch me show films about gasoline. You can do this in, um, in your house or at work. That'd be great if you're watching this at work. Um, anyhow, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you didn't know, I collect old 16 millimeter educational films and we're actually using this Telecine, which is a film transfer machine. And I'm actually threading up the film and we're watching them live the internet so as some of you know things go crazy sometimes things fall apart films break etc etc so let's see what we got here so I pulled quite a few films um, some of that I just got recently which uh, I have not shown anybody so this is kind of exciting um, this next film for example But I'm excited that, you know, YouTube and uh, Facebook could give me the opportunity to show these films. Um, although I have had my hand slapped by both of those entities regarding uh, content that I put online uh, that was either the music was copyrighted or the show was copyrighted. 
So, at any point, the hammer could come down, and you'll go like, what? What happened? We must have lost contact. And it's like, no, YouTube decided that um, the background music I have in one film is so important that we have to shut the whole thing down. So, um, I've seen that's happened to NASA, too, during their live streaming, so I don't feel so bad. Uh, all right, so this next film is called The Service Station. Enjoy. In every neighborhood today, there is a service station. You can probably remember seeing one in your own neighborhood. Here you can buy gasoline and oil for your car. And you receive many other services as well. Because so many people have cars today, service stations are very important. Long ago, there weren't many service stations. You probably know the reason why. In those days, long ago, there weren't many automobiles. The few there were would seem funny to us today. People wore special coats to keep dirt from the dusty road off their clothes. And the goggles kept dust out of their eyes. If you had lived in those days, you would have found that a drive in the family car was a real adventure. Something like a pioneer adventure. If you had a flat tire, as you often did on such poor roads, there wasn't a service station nearby to have it fixed. You had to fix it yourself. Pumping up a tire by hand was hard work. But a pioneer's work is always hard. There were only a few service stations in those days. Often they were out back of the local hardware store. They weren't really service stations as we know them today, but here you could buy gasoline. If you wanted five gallons, the storekeeper would measure it out one gallon at a time. The storekeeper kept a barrel of oil on hand for your strange looking machine. But the chances were, you'd have to show him where to put the oil. In those days, long ago, there were few service stations because only a few people owned cars. Today, there are a great many cars and trucks. Cars carry people to work on trips and on vacations. Trucks carry many things that people need from place to place. Service stations are much different today because they serve so many more people. Today, big tank trucks deliver large amounts of gasoline to a service station. The driver takes out a long, heavy hose from his truck. There are large storage tanks underground at every service station. The driver puts one end of the hose in a hole that leads to an underground tank. The other end of the hose is connected to his tank truck.
He then pulls a handle that starts the gasoline flowing from his truck through the long, heavy hose to the underground storage tank. A meter shows how many gallons of gasoline are going into the underground tank. The underground tanks hold enough gasoline for many automobiles. It is brought up to your car by these familiar pumps above ground. Men who run service stations are called dealers or managers. And a man who works for them is called an attendant. The attendant finds out what kind and how much gasoline you want. He then gets the pump ready for a new sale. The attendant takes out a long hose. He places the hose in your car's tank. As he squeezes the handle, gasoline pours into the tank. The attendant watches the numbers on the pump. If you want five gallons, he'll stop the pump when five gallons are delivered. Other numbers on the pump show how much money the five gallons cost. The attendant also checks under the hood of your car. He looks to see if there is enough water in your radiator. If more is needed, he pulls out a special water hose to fill the radiator. He replaces the cap when the radiator is full. All cars need oil. The attendant checks to see if there is enough oil in your car. He pulls out a long metal rod from the engine. The end of the rod shows when more oil is needed. Oil is often sold at a service station in quart bottles or cans. Today's service station attendant knows exactly where and how to put oil in everybody's car. The attendant also checks your tires. He uses the air hose to do this. He places the end of the hose on the tire valve. Air goes into the tire when the button is pressed. A gauge shows how much air. Every time the button is pressed, more air goes into the tire until the gauge shows that the tire contains the right amount. The service station attendant washes your windshield so that it's bright and clear. Then you pay him for the gasoline and oil. His other services are free. Some service stations keep the money drawer in the station house, and it's here where the attendant goes to get your change. Every car needs another kind of service, called lubrication to make it run smoothly. The attendant pushes a handle which raises your car off the ground on a special rack. Many of the parts he lubricates are underneath the car.
A device called a grease gun is designed to lubricate a car. It is used to force heavy grease into many parts of your automobile. Other parts underneath are oiled while your car is on the lubrication rack. Many useful tools are used at a service station to help the attendant do his work. This tool is used to help fix a flat tire. How much better and faster this is than long ago, when there were only a few service stations. Today, there are many cars and many service stations. You see them everywhere, serving people during the day and some of them staying open around the clock to serve people who travel at night. Service stations are everywhere. Certainly there is one in your neighborhood too. We distribute a bunch of stuff through DFA or Bailey Films. Um, you know, I like these. Uh, they give us a sense of, um, you know, what a service station was like in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, I noticed people were talking about the gas. Yeah, that's going to come up a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it's interesting to think about you know, gas stations, there's less gas stations now. Uh, it's mostly uh, drug stores. And now, even then, drug stores are fading away and being replaced by mattress stores. So, you know, what is the convenient thing uh, nowadays? The space thing. So, watching films like this give you this sense. You, you can look back and say, like, huh, yeah, there used to be a gas station everywhere. And now, those gas stations are empty and... They turn into video stores, and oh no, those are empty, and now they're, um, you know, sweepstakes or computer um, fish table games or, you know, whatever. Uh, it's, it's a constant change and flux uh, with convenience and things like that. So, let's see. God, so many films to choose from. I know what you're saying. I'd love to watch a, a propaganda film about the gasoline and petroleum industry. Well... Thankfully, I've got just the film. Um, it's a Sutherland uh, sponsored film. By the Amer I think it's the American Petroleum Institute. And it's about free enterprise and um, about how petroleum impacts that and how that's part of what drives it. Um, you know, all these things are fascinating because these are all post uh, World War II post-depression, and this was uh, a return. Basically, um, after the Depression, there were a lot of uh, laws that were enacted to protect the consumer and the American economy from, uh, and also dealing with monopolies and robber barons, all that stuff, uh, was, in, was in place to protect the American consumer uh, and the American economy. And as soon as World War II was over, the attack to roll all that stuff back was beginning to happen uh, very quickly. Uh, in fact, I think it was beginning to happen during World War II. And conveniently, they had a scapegoat, and that was the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, and the idea that free enterprise was an American capitalist thing, uh, the alternative being godless communism, um, it was very convenient uh, to have things that talk about free enterprise and talk about um, capitalism as being good for the United States. And, you know, we are still hearing that rhetoric. It's the same words um, and same things that are happening. Uh, and it's interesting to see it back then when it was fresh and when it was animated. So this is uh, Destination Earth. Enjoy.
see your smiling faces once more. First, let me say that this trip was made possible only by our dauntless chief, Og the Magnificent, introducer of Og Power, which runs most of our industry, and inventor of Og Speed, Ow! which doubles the original Og Power. A short time ago, the master was having trouble with the state limousine. He had, of course, developed the explosive charge. But it was inclined to get a little out of hand, just slight. And of course, there was always the problem of friction. Parts rubbing, heating up, and causing all sorts of trouble. But, but our, our leader was undaunted. He immediately ordered our first expedition into space to bring back the secret of how other planets got their state limousines to run smoothly. The target was picked with painstaking scientific accuracy. Destination, Earth. You all know with what eagerness I volunteered for the mission, and with what confidence I took off. I took careful bearings and set out for my goal. It seemed no time till I was approaching a country of Earth called, uh, uh, the United States of America. I set her down like a feather. What's all the racket? Naturally, I protected government property by making the saucer invisible. They're after the chicken, Ma! Oh, the natives showed great interest in me. I decided to make myself invisible, too. Seeing moving lights in the distance, I headed for them. What phenomenal luck! I had landed close to what seemed to be an endless procession of state limousines. They moved quickly, and yet with fantastic smoothness. I just had to get a closer look at one of those Earthmobiles. Just as I thought. Not only smooth and efficient, but powerful as well. I watched them for hours. Great Ganymede, they were superb. I just couldn't help comparing them with ours. If you call that a comparison. <laughs> Surely these vehicles must be the property of the highest officials. I was wrong. 
it seems that almost everybody in this country has one of those, uh, uh, they call them automobiles. They use them for transportation, for business, for pleasure. They use them for all sorts of things. I found that these vehicles gather at places called service stations, where they are fed, lubricated, uh, that's how they beat friction, and given the finest care. The source of their nourishment was something called petroleum. A power source like that must be a highly prized state secret. I had to find out about it. Mm. Perhaps the secret lay within this government archives building. It was heavily guarded, but casting discretion to the wind, I walked boldly inside. Their code was remarkably easy to break. They merely substituted the word oil for petroleum. And I soon got hold of a veritable mine of classified information. I began to assimilate the material. I soon found out that though petroleum products are easily found anywhere, petroleum itself is a very elusive substance. You have to search for it constantly in all the most likely and unlikely places with all kinds of scientific devices. When they figure they found a good spot, they drill a hole in the ground called an oil well, for almost all oil lies far beneath the surface of the earth. These wells go down thousands of feet and cost a lot of money to drill. But that's no guarantee that they're going to find oil. Matter of fact, in exploratory drilling, only one well in nine finds any oil at all. Only one in 44 recovers enough oil to pay for itself. And only one in almost a thousand makes a major discovery. Pretty big odds. Yet America's proved reserves the oil supplies still underground have kept increasing steadily. I couldn't imagine how this ever-increasing supply of oil was achieved until I found out that there's not just one, but thousands of oil companies, all competing with each other to discover and develop new sources of oil. For believe it or not, in the USA, anyone who is willing to risk it can drill for oil. But oil discovery is only part of the story. Once they get oil out of the ground, it has to be moved through pipelines, on ships, or in tank cars, to fantastic processing plants called refineries. Crude oil goes in, and great Jupiter, the things that come out. Gasoline, for example, the most efficient mobile power source on Earth. That was the stuff that powered all those cars and trucks. And asphalt, which makes smooth, durable roads. It seems that oil not only runs cars, it even gives them something to run on. Another oil product is the diesel fuel, which runs giant trains across the nation. In winter, fuel oil made from petroleum brings warmth and comfort to millions of homes. And still other fuels help defend America's shores and skies. From refineries also come the lubricating oils and greases that keep the wheels turning in America. But that still isn't all. Crude oil, like everything else, is made up of billions of tiny molecules. And using the magic of research, Oil companies compete with each other in taking the petroleum molecule apart and rearranging it into, well, you name it, fabrics, toothbrushes, tires, insecticides, cosmetics, weed killers, a whole galaxy of things to make a better life on Earth. And you know, it isn't just oil companies that try to outdo each other competing for the customer's dollar. The same story is true of almost every successful business enterprise in America. The result? A higher standard of living in the USA than in any other country on the whole planet. At last, the secret was mine. And now to get proof of my discovery smuggled past the border guards. <laughs> 
In spite of my infinite precaution, one of them became suspicious and gave the alarm. Come back for the eggs, did you? Yeah! And so, with the fond farewells of the natives ringing in my ears, I took off once again for Mars. My landing was a little bumpy, but I saved my precious cargo. Yes, I brought the secrets back with me. And here they are. The big secret is, of course, oil, which has brought a better life to all the people in the USA. But the key to making oil work for everybody is competition. Fellow Martians, I thank you. Mm, very interesting, Colonel. Oil, huh? Sounds splendid. But that, uh, what was it? Uh, competition. Not our kind of thing at all. Why, competition is downright unmarked. Oil? You'll have oil for everybody. That's all we need. Oh, boy. The real secret is not only a great source of energy, but also the freedom to make it work for everybody. And if you have both of these things, any goal is possible. It's destination unlimited. <laughs> Oil is awesome. <laughs> oh, I love this film. It's so great. It's so, so much fun. Um, there's a lot of films from that time period, that, that uh, kind of late 50s. Um, capitalism is great. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, films made by a steel and tool company, and it's all talking about the importance of tools and the ownership of tools and manufacturing of tools. Um, and, of course, it takes swipes at the uh, Soviet Union, saying that tools belonged to everybody. There's no actual ownership of tools. Um, and tools are what make our country great. Uh, so I dabble into those films occasionally. They are uh, definitely affected public policy in the United States and lobbying forever uh, and ever and to this day. Um, <clears throat> so, we talked about how great gas is, um, and now it's time to mix it up a little bit. Let's see where it is. Yes. I'm excited by this one. It's... Uh, See if you can see it. Gasoline and water heaters just don't mix. So let me thread this one up. Uh, safety films are always great. Um, especially ones that potentially have explosions. Uh, if you caught the uh, beginning, uh, I know I, I kind of... I didn't get it live on Facebook in time, but there was a film called Automobiles, which was like, the the intro was, hey kids, let's learn how to do a controlled explosion after after these messages. <laughs> it was essentially, then they kind of talked about the concept, and then they showed the experiment, and the guy's like, now be sure to do it exactly as we say, otherwise it could be very dangerous. Well, guess what? It is very dangerous. <laughs> in this narrow range of, don't add too much gas. Don't let it evaporate too much. You know, 
don't do it, you know, in your living room, do it outside, all that stuff. Anyhow, uh, this is by, I think I've, I have notes on this one, uh, uh, Film Communicators. Film Communicators actually made films for um, fire departments. And I feel like, I don't have the 100%, but I feel like they were splintered off of the LA Fire Department film unit. Like that was a thing. And then at some point, somebody was like, well, we'll just make these films and then we'll sell them to other uh, fire departments across the country and make money. So they have a lot of films that deal with uh, fire safety um, and uh, the safety, public safety in general. Um, so this is uh, gasoline and water heaters just don't mix. All right, enjoy. This is a true story of how a tiny flame, a pilot light on a gas water heater combined with gasoline vapors, resulted in a tragic loss. It happened to the McCann family in Bryan, Texas. I'm Judy McCann, and I'm the mother of Karen and J.E. And J.E.'s the one that got burned. And Karen was babysitting at the time. I, had came, I came home from work to um, take Jay to the gas station to get some gas for the lawnmower. And uh, when we got back, Jay went in the house to uh, start the lawnmower and I started to tell him to take it outside, but I didn't. And uh, I just thought he would know to take it outside. But he, did, he didn't know. My name is Jay Clayton. I'm 12 years old and yesterday my mother told me to mow the lawn because the grass was getting too high. So we went to the gas station to fill up the gas can and to get some motor oil. So I decided to put the motor oil in first. I just poured the motor oil in and I had gotten some on my hand. And so I picked up the gas and I was starting to pour it but it slipped because of the motor oil and I picked it up and I got gas on my hand. Well, I was picking it up, and the fumes went under the door, and it caught on fire with the pilot light from the water heater, and I stood up, and my hand caught on fire, and I shook the flames off onto my foot, and then I ran around to the front of, to tell Karen. I'm Karen McKinn, age 15. I was at home babysitting my two little cousins when I went out to see what he was yelling about and I saw the fire so I ran back into the house to call my mother but halfway through the dialing I decided that that wouldn't be a wise idea that's not what uh, the fire prevention films at school and said they said to wait and go next door at a neighbor's to call so I threw the phone down and stood in the middle of the kitchen yelling for the kids to get out of the house Jennifer, the youngest of the kids I was babysitting, was in the living room playing with her toys, and Erica was in the back bedroom by the garage. When I said run outside, she thought I said run and hide. So she hid in the closet, which is right behind the water heater. She finally realized that I was saying fire and to run, but she still took the time to pick up her stuffed animals, and she should have not done that, because that took a little longer. After that, we all ran outside and across the street to our neighbors, where we called the fire department. And they were there within five minutes, and they battled the fire. So, and we, I was there for about 30 minutes, and then we went to the hospital to get my burns treated. So, I, 
uh, they traded my burns, and it 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 was painful. It, it hurt a lot. Karen called me at at work, and um, told me that the house was burning, and from the urgency in her voice and the scared feeling that I got from her, I knew that it, it was serious. So I just hung the phone up and raced out of the shop. And uh, on the way over here, I was just praying that the kids would be all right, that nobody would get hurt. And uh, when I got here and I turned the corner, I saw Karen out in the neighbor's yard, and I knew that she was all right. And I saw J.E. over th at the neighbor's yard with uh, his foot soaking in a, a tub and his hand in there. And I didn't know how bad he was burned. And so I, I was looking for the other two children, my two nieces. And uh, after I realized that the four children were all right, I looked at the house and it was just blazing with uh, flames and smoke was coming out everywhere. And I just started crying and I just didn't know what to do. Until something like this happens to you or to someone close to you, it's hard to believe that such devastation can be caused by something as small as the pilot light on a water heater. Yet when you think about it, all fires start out small, from a tiny heat source, a match, a cigarette, an electrical spark, or the heat from a burner on a stove. So what can this tragedy teach us? Wayne Matthews, J.E.'s uncle, tells us what he learned. Uh, in all these, uh, accidents there's a reason for them and I was talking to the farmer here and they informed me that the reason for this accident was the gas uh, vapors was heavier than air and they floated in under the door and went to the pilot light on the hot water heater and this ignited the fumes and it it traveled back along these vapors to the fuel can, and this ignited that, went from one place to another, and it uh, would be a blessing, really, if we could inform everybody that has a, a gas hot water heater just how dangerous a can of gasoline is around these hot water heaters. Uh, the What they tell me, that these vapors can travel uh, a good distance to the flames of the of the pilot light there on the hot water heater. The hot water heater doesn't have to be burning. Just the uh, pilot light is all it takes. It's a small spark or something. So gasoline in any closed quarters or something like that is very dangerous. And uh, it, it just won't uh, pay a person to keep a dollar's worth of gas around where that it's going to cost him $100,000. It just don't make good sense. You take uh, one little spark, one little can of gas, can destroy a $100,000 home in just one little hour, and it's, it's over. It's too late to, to uh, do anything about it. The way to prevent a fire is to stop all the places for them to start. The only uh, way that a person can, uh, can do that is to uh, check around and see just what he has got in his garages and things like that. I'm wearing the same clothes as I was yesterday. It would have been better if I had jeans and long jeans and shoes on because I wouldn't have got my foot burned so you can tell I'm real lucky. I'm just so thankful that uh, Karen had the good sense to, to know to get the children out of the house first and that J.E., even though he was burned, ran back in the house to tell Karen that the garage was on fire. And uh, I'm just so thankful and proud of my children for the way they handled it. So let's review a few basic safety rules. Don't store or handle flammable liquids near an open flame. Wear sensible clothing when handling flammable liquids. If your clothes do catch on fire, know what to do. Stop, drop, and roll. Treat any burns by cooling them with cold water. Make a home inspection plan and know where possible dangers are. 
and if there is a fire, get out of the house fast and stay out. Then call the fire department or go for help. As you see, this has been a terrible experience for me and my family. And I hope you'll learn from watching this film that gasoline and gas hot water heaters just don't mix. We've suffered a great loss here today, but it'd be worth every penny of it if it saved someone's family or children or something like that from an accident like we've had here today. I think in the past somebody complained that it's like all your films are faded red. They all look horrible. Well, not all of them. Some of them have keep good color. This one was made in the 80s, so it was made on a uh, low fade stock. Uh, and then that one from the 50s was a, a either Technicolor or Kodachrome. It's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Beautiful film stock. Um, why does it fade red? Well, some of you know, it's the dyes uh, over a period of time begin to fade, and they do it unequally. So you, um, your cyans, your blues start going away, and your greens, and what you're left with are reds, magentas, things like that, yellows. So it's the challenge. Uh, and some people have said, oh, well, that's vinegar syndrome. No, it's actually a different thing. Vinegar syndrome is film. Most film that I have was uh, has an acetate base. That's clear plastic acetate. And when acetate breaks down, it makes acetic acid, which is vinegar uh, or vinegar smell, and uh, it stinks. And what happens is the film begins to curl and shrink, and sprocket holes begin to deform so they don't fit in a traditional projector and then it gets more difficult and then it just kind of turns into what we call a hockey puck where it's almost impossible to get uh, the film off without it crinkling or um, it's so seized up that if you try to separate it it just just falls apart so um, vinegar syndrome separate from uh, just color fading um, so speaking of beautiful color this is a short film that I got from Memphis, Tennessee. I got a bunch of films, uh, educational films, but also I got films that were from a company that made ads for theaters uh, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, so there's pretty much always been ads in theaters. Uh, and so these were for local businesses, and these were demo commercials that uh, a person could use for their local business, and then they could tack on a little card at the end that says, you know, only two blocks from this theater. So these are ads for Sinclair. Sinclair was a gas station. I don't even know if it still exists, if it got bought and is now part of BP or who knows. I don't know who owns them. Maybe somebody can that up. Uh, anyway, Sinclair, uh, known for the dinosaur logo, because, you know, gasoline is made from dinosaurs. Um, and so here is uh, a couple of ads uh, for Sinclair uh, gas and petroleum. Enjoy. Aren't you glad you had that lube job? Aren't you glad your tires were checked? 
Aren't you glad your brakes were checked? Like your Sinclair dealer suggested. Oil, water, fan belt, transmission, differential, battery, all checked carefully by your thorough Sinclair dealer. You'll have safer, more comfortable driving when your car is checked regularly by your Sinclair dealer. For better products, better service, see your neighborly Sinclair dealer. Drive in regularly at the Sinclair sign. Call H. Dean Morgan Oil Company. Creatures no human has ever seen. Dinosaurs that lived 100 million years ago when oil was forming. Today, Sinclair brings you the power of these age-old petroleum crudes in Sinclair Dino Supreme, the modern premium gasoline for modern high-powered cars. This power in the making 100 million years can be the making of your car's performance. Can make your car run smoother, more powerfully. Try Sinclair Dino Supreme Premium Gasoline. Cochran Oil Company says get service as you like it and quality, dependable Sinclair products at your Sinclair dealer, Morford Service. Drive in at the familiar Sinclair sign. From the age of dinosaurs comes a great new name in power. Dino Supreme, the advanced premium gasoline, now at the sign of Sinclair. Cleans as it powers, keeps your engine running smoother longer, rewards the smart driver who wants all the power he paid for in his high-powered car. Sinclair Dino Supreme. Particular car owners have their cars serviced at Casey's on Tanagan because of Lloyd's meticulous attention to each and every car. Imagine this is your car. To protect it against wear, to keep it running at top economy, what lubricant goes here? What grease here? And here? You don't have to know. Your Sinclair dealer knows. He's an expert on good car care. See him regularly for expert car saving service. At Sinclair, we care about you, about your car. Drive into your nearby Sinclair dealer station for friendly service and quality Sinclair products. And remember to always drive with care and buy Sinclair. Dependable as sunrise and as welcome as a summer morning, your Sinclair farm supplier. His fuel and lubrication experience and the Sinclair gasolines, motor oils, and lubricants he delivers right to your farm help cut farm costs and make the work go easier. That's because at Sinclair, we care about you, about your farm. Call your Sinclair supplier. Stop at the Sinclair sign for the finest products and best service in town. At Sinclair, we care about you, your home, and your car. Call Champion Oil Service Company for all your needs. Gasoline, heating oil, or service for your heating unit. Every farmer knows farm works no cinch. And any man who can make farm work easier or reduce farm costs is welcome indeed. Then welcome your Sinclair supplier. His prompt delivery of Sinclair products plus his friendly advice on their use, can cut costs and lessen work. At Sinclair, we care about you, about your farm. Call your Sinclair supplier. In the home or on the farm, all Sinclair products delivered promptly by Waterford Oil Company, monthly budget plan, keep bill service 24 hours a day. Modern Sinclair oil heat is so comfortable, reliable, and completely automatic that you rarely think about your oil burner. But Sinclair thinks about it. Sinclair has oil burner specialists to give it the service it needs, money-saving service that keeps it at top efficiency, top economy. Call your Sinclair supplier for Sinclair oil burner service. At Sinclair, we care about you, about your home. For 24-hour heat, Complete service. Dial 246-2391. With automatic oil heat, the comforting warmth spreads out through room after room. And with Sinclair's budget heating plan, your heating costs are spread out too. 
Yes, spread out over months and months. Your budget will love it. So call your Sinclair supplier. Remember, at Sinclair, we care about you, about your home. For the best in car care, come to Bill Sinclair. We care more for your car than you do. Call Woody Wood for trouble-free heating fuel and all bulk delivery. Prompt, efficient service. Well, that was a short reel. Um, yeah, so that was a demos. Uh, it's what it's entitled Sinclair Oil Demo Reel. Um, so it's a variety of Sinclair ads um, that were shown in theaters and uh, maybe on television too. Rewind this real quick. So this next film is is a interesting challenge. This is an eBay purchase, and um, it's on a core. So there's no reel. Um, so it's kind of loose on a core. I have to be careful. I have. Um, it's not very tightly packed on here, so this might be a problem to run, but we're going to try it anyways because it's worth it. It's one of these weird things that only you can find on eBay that don't have any correlation to anything else in the world. There's, there's not going to be a, a listing of it in a catalog. There's not going to be a listing of it. It's, I think that this was an internally made film for people at a gas company. Um, and I have a couple of those kind of internal documents. Not necessarily gag reels, but uh, like meant to be shown at a conference, convention, um, kind of get people, you know, a little light. It's a way to kind of make fun of what you do a little bit. Everybody in a good mood before you bore them to tears with uh, a slideshow uh, and dress them down for not selling, making the sales numbers. Um, so this is, it's the title is Atlantic Imperial Gas Promo, but that's not really the title. I don't know what it is. This is, it's kind of cut up from something. So I, I'm not sure what it is, and we'll see if we can get this to thread up. I'll do it while we're watching. Um, this might not work, um, which means I might have to show something else in the interim, and, and well, I don't know, we'll see. So I had to put on a special um, uh, kind of flat thing on the telecine and a different type of uh, watch my doodle, you know, technical terms. Um, yeah, I'm sure you're super interested in this. <laughs> but this is what it is, you know? It's like live. We are putting these on live. So let's see if this syncs up. Well, I did it. All right. Well, there you go. Um, all right, well, let's give this a shot and see what happens. Um, give me a sec. Adjust something right here, and thank you for telling me that my mic was on at the time. I will turn it off now. Well, just thought you might like to see that. Now, of course, it has nothing whatsoever to do with a clean carburetor, but everybody needs a little lift at the beginning of a meeting. Thank you, Sherman. Gentlemen, tonight from New Hampshire to Florida, close to 10,000 dealers and their driveway salesmen are assembled to hear about our new Imperial campaign. And we extend a very hearty welcome to you new dealers, too. Let's hear it for the new dealers. Welcome aboard, gentlemen. 
I said, we've had a good year. A successful year for Atlantic. In fact, because of you dealers, our customers now have the cleanest carburetors in town. Sir! Oh, sir! Excuse me, just a minute. I've just got to tell uh, but, someone. But, madam, we've got... <laughs> is this yours? This is my carburetor. It's a clean carburetor. A fine, true, good carburetor. It used to be dirty. But Atlantic Imperial has made it a beautiful, dependable part of the family car. And useful, too. Sir, my life has changed. I'm a changed woman. Babies change. Uh, regularly? Of course. Mm. The grass is greener. Oh, really now? Uh, my carburetor's cleaner. Uh, oh, sir, uh -huh. if I could just tell the world yeah, what well, Atlantic Imperial has sure, done for sure. me. Sure, well, I'll tell you the world is... Listen, a, a world! That's right, madam. That's all right. That's why we're here, madam. To tell the world. The whole world. And that's why we're here. The whole world will now believe me that is. <laughs> that's enthusiasm. Well, gentlemen, our service to the public has been better than ever this year. Our position in the competition picture has improved. In many markets, we're a solid number one. And our profits, your profits, have been greater. We intend to make those profits even greater this year. Now, you know, that's a wonderful word, profit. But profit depends on a great many things, mainly people, satisfied people, satisfied customers. Now, do you remember last spring, these satisfied customers? Go home, everybody. Uh, we'll abolish all your nuts who want use Atlantic Imperial. Thank you. Thank you. My car really runs well now on Atlantic Imperial. Thank you. And the carburetor is clean, too. Thank you. It's a nice car. Good gasoline. Thank you. That car really goes, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Well, during the past year, through your efforts, Millions of motorists discover that Atlantic Imperial actually does clean carburetors. And by so doing, gives better performance. Your customers told you, and we got it through thousands of unsolicited testimonials. And so, by the end of 1960, we were convinced that, indeed, millions did know about Atlantic Imperial. Well, it was terrific. It was like an avalanche, gentlemen, a, a slow, steady beginning, a mounting crescendo, more and more, here and there, everywhere, millions now know. And you know, believe it or not, even though there are millions who know, there are millions more who should know. And to prove this to you, we went to great expense to employ this highly specialized technique that has been made popular through television. We placed several hidden cameras in many of our marketing territories. Thus, unseen by the customer, our concealed cameramen were able to record some rather startling discoveries. Now, here's what we found when we developed our film. Adam, are you sure your carburetor is clean? I beg your pardon, young man. Don't get personal. Our ace cameraman in one very strategic location went on to win an Academy Award. Good morning. Should I fall with the Imperial today? <laughs> hold it, hold it. I got the Formula Moons worked out pretty good for Betsy and me all these years. No. Give me uh, $2.43 worth of uh, Imperial. That cleans my carburetor. And a dollar ninety-seven cents worth of regular. Well, that ain't quite half and half, but it's a good one anyway. And that, uh, let me see, it leaves me uh, eh, dime for butter, Dr. Pepper. Complete secrecy and privacy was most necessary. Shall I fill her up with the Atlantic Imperial? Well. No, 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 no. She's driving. 
But I could use a refill. The hidden eye, ever watchful. Shall we fill with the Imperial? It'll clean your carburetor. Oh, man. Clean my carburetor? Listen, Daddy, oh, like I'm on my way to the laundromat. Like you dig, man? Like I can clean my own carburetor, man. <laughs> Ain't that wild, Daddy? <laughs> well, as you can see, you've been telling your customers the clean carburetor story. But there are those customers you just can't reach. Now, let's figure this one out. The clean carburetor story has been described by some as, um, well, almost magic. Now, I wonder how a magician would figure this out. See, I, I remember a magician my old daddy told me about. I wonder what, what was his name now? Charlemagne Linga Shuni. Shuni. Uh, Charlie for short. That's it. Charlie. 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 Char Hey, Charlie! Hey, hi, buddy. Don't... Listen, uh, uh, we're, you're going to be here for a few minutes, and let me put a dime in the parking lot. Wait, Chunk. <laughs> Listen, how are things in Strangeville, Charlie, old horse? <laughs> oh, I'm a size, how you, how you hold? Charlie, look, here's the problem. Um, can we be alone? Flee, flee, tell you, for you. <laughs> And then it ends as mysteriously as it begins. All right, hold oh, on, my. Stops again. So get this to work. Nope. I need to rewind this. Um, yeah. This is a lot nuttier than I remember it being. <laughs> and I, I haven't seen it in like 15 years, like from when I first got it. And I was like, what is. I remember Castro's in it somehow, but I don't remember why. <laughs> and so, yeah. All the hits. I like they just tacked on a, a V end to it. So, uh, yeah. Ends as mysteriously as it begins. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, and, and the way the intro reads is it seems like they show something even goofier than this. So, or they did something goofier. Who knows? Um, so, maybe one day. There's a, there was a Shell Oil short piece that I did that featured a woman, Carol Lane, who was a travel consultant for Shell Oil. And so I showed it around... It was clipped out of a TV show, and sure enough, um, someone, a friend of mine, did a whole research project about um, Carol Lane, who was actually kind of like Betty Pro Crocker. It was a bunch of, of Cheryl Lanes, or Carol Lanes. Uh, and so she did this whole research thing about, about this. So maybe one day someone will say, that awesome Atlantic Imperial uh, gas promo? I've been looking for that, and here's the whole story behind it. Um, you know, that's why we do what I do. That's why I show people stuff. Um, if it's sitting on a shelf, nobody's going to know about it. So I put it out there. It's a little bit tighter than it was. Um, again, that was on a core. So um, that's a way, really, it's, it's better to have films on cores um, for uh, archival purposes, but not for screening purposes. So... Okay, so I'm going to show two more films, and these are, um, the first one I'm going to show is called uh, 24 Hours of Progress, and it is, uh, 
um, another American uh, Petroleum Institute film, which talks about progress is basically oil. So there you go. Uh, and then I'm going to let you guys vote. You have a choice of two films, and I'm just going to read you the titles. I'm not going to tell you what they're about. One is called Petrox, A Miracle of Petroleum. The other is Inside the Big E. So Petrox, A Miracle of Petroleum, or Inside the Big E. I want you to vote for one of those titles um, while we watch uh, 24 Hours of Progress. Um, I should say, also, if you can, God, I never get this right. Um, if you like what you saw, there's ways you can support the AV Geeks. One way is to watch and to chime in and tell your friends and have them watch. And these, unless they get flagged for copyright, uh, these will be up on uh, Facebook and YouTube uh, as long as those people consider that having them up there is, is a way to make money, um, which, you know, could be t tomorrow. But anyways, um... Oh, that's not right. That's not right at all. Huh. Sorry, this is not flipped right. Alright, this is rewound wrong. This would have been a problem. Uh, anyhow, um, yeah, so how can you support AV Geeks? One is uh, watch stuff. Uh, tell people about it. Get them to watch it. Uh, spread the word. It's about getting eyeballs on these films and on um, these, these things. And... Um, another way is to go to avgeeks.com and buy DVDs. We have over 200 for sale. And another way is to donate on Patreon. Patreon is a, a subscription like tip jar for artists and for people to do blogs and comics and uh, podcasts and video casts. And the money that we uh, get from this, we actually spend buying more stuff, buying more equipment. Uh, we upgraded our digitizer, um, made that better, and we're slowly upgrading our equipment. Um, and I love doing this. I love getting your feedback, and that's really kind of what keeps me doing it. The money is great, and it helps um, when I am like, wow, I wonder if I should buy this absurd film on eBay. Well, having a Patreon thing coming in guarantees that I will buy it. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, but yeah, just watch it. Even if you can't afford it, just I, I enjoy your comments and I enjoy uh, people watching it and your feedback. So, uh, okay. So, uh, as I said, you have choice: Petrox, uh, a miracle protein of petroleum, Petrox, a miracle petroleum, or inside the Big E. So, uh, choose one of those and vote. And we will be back, and we will watch whatever you choose. So this is uh, 24 hours of progress. Enjoy. Production of oil is a measure of American progress. As our nation grows, so grows our need for petroleum. This year, every 24 hours, six and one half million barrels of petroleum will be drawn from the earth by our producing oil companies. How will it all be used? Let's start at midnight and watch what happens on any single day. Let's say it's Tuesday. In the early hours down on the Gulf of Mexico, a new source of oil is being sought. If this well comes in, it will not only help to fuel planes, cars, and ships, and make us strong in arms, it will also serve America in many ways of which we may not be aware. 
It even plays a part in the operating room where petroleum byproducts appear as the drug, the alcohol and anesthetics that may help to save a life or start one. It's morning now, 7.31. The sun is shining somewhere in the Middle West on the construction of an eight-lane superhighway. The ancient Romans were road builders too, but they had slaves to do the work. Today, we push our roads just where we want them to go. Now, the strength in a man's back or in his arms is not important. It's the strength he controls at his fingertips that counts. Now, at a West Coast airport, the 815 plane bound east across the continent is being fueled with gasoline from one of thousands of competing oil companies. Competition among these companies assures our progress, just as competition helped make the change from the Conestoga wagon to the Constellation. We Americans can compete because we're free, free to fly 3,000 miles across one united land with only a ticket and a baggage check as our passport. In the United States, nine o'clock in the morning means time for school. Mrs. George W. Martin starts on her first errand of the day to get gasoline for the car. To Mrs. Martin, her service station is the oil industry. 95% of America's service stations are run by independent businessmen like Ed Felix. He is an oil man. And like the industry he represents, he knows all about competition. He knows that to compete successfully, he must do more than sell gasoline and oil. He must give service, the kind that will make his station the favorite in town. As the day moves on, and as the Ed Felixes all over the country serve their public, the American farmer is also using up petroleum and many of its products. Oil does scores of jobs farmers would once have thought were miracles. Today, with petroleum, a farmer can fight the odds of nature instead of giving in to them. It becomes easy now to see why new oil must constantly be found. Out here in California, a geophysical crew is taking the first step making a seismograph survey of what a piece of land looks like underground. They start by placing dynamite in shallow holes filled with water. Then they explode the dynamite. The sound waves are recorded as they echo off the underground formation. But the seismograph picture just tells where oil might be. The only way of actually finding it is to drill. On this Tuesday afternoon in West Texas, a producing company is getting ready to do just that, drill a well. They know that eight out of every nine wells drilled in new areas turn out to be dry holes. But even then, they're willing to risk as much as a million dollars on a single well just on the chance of striking oil. Between the crude oil from the ground and finished petroleum products is the refinery. Just four decades ago, a refinery was a primitive still making mostly kerosene. Today, some of these great plants employ thousands of people. To many an American community, their establishment and growth has meant new economic life. Every day, vast quantities of oil move out by tank car and by great pipeline systems. One of the biggest carriers of oil is the modern tanker. 
This one will carry five million gallons of petroleum product. While the tanker is loading in California, an oil barge is heading up the Mississippi for the docks of an independent jobber. And in New York at 3 p.m. this Tuesday, the SS America is taking on fuel. Since petroleum provides the power for our ships of peace and ships of war, oil power means sea power for our nation. Power for the sea is also power for the land. The automobile has been a major factor in the growth of our country. To meet the demands of motorists who drive a billion miles a day, oil canning plants also work around the clock. It seems no other people in the world want so much to just get going when they have a little time. Maybe it's just that no other people can get going so easily. The oil scientists and rough pace setters in the race of progress, working with products still unnamed and some that are still unthought of. Our thousands of privately managed oil companies invest millions of dollars every year in research. Each company's objective is the same. Discover a new product, perfect it, and get it on the market before the others do. They start with competition. What they create is progress. With the switch to another brand of gasoline, or with the purchase of a new detergent, a company has lost a customer. Another company has gained one. Our Mrs. Martin just today has already used some 87 petroleum products, including the plastic bacon wrapper and the wax of the milk carton. Mrs. Martin is the customer, and the customer is the boss of the oil industry. This Tuesday's daylight has almost gone. Electric power stations are getting ready for peak load. Even though the old oil lamp is a thing of the past, oil still helps light up America. Our Tuesday is ending. The air travelers from the west have crossed a whole continent in a few hours. But not for one mile were they out of sight of the men and women of the petroleum industry. The night shift at the refinery has taken over on the stills and fractionating columns. At Ed Felix's, there's still someone to give you service. At the well on the gulf, the drilling bit, chewing at the rock beneath the bayou, may be closer to oil than it was last night. It is midnight again. Our Tuesday has waned and is gone. In the oil fields, the pump continues hour by hour throughout the 24. It pumps from Tuesday into Wednesday without a halt. Each day, every day, it brings us another 24 hours of progress, building our nation, guarding its security, assuring the future of America. So, um, <laughs> I mentioned that sometimes technology, anything can happen. Well, yeah, something happens. <laughs> um, thankfully, there's not film spilled all over the floor, but uh, the, um, let me see if I can actually see myself here. So, the, 
remember how I always said that it was something was threaded wrong? Um, well, so I did this kind of nifty trick to uh, make it thread right. Well, the um, scanner didn't like that. <laughs> so when it reached the end, it had this weird tension thing, and then it completely freaked out. Completely freaked out. But it did actually rewind itself in the right way. So that could have gone horribly wrong. Um, and it has in the past where it, film is sprayed everywhere and it's like, all right, well, the show's over. Um, so knock on, thank, thank you. Um, thank you, tell us any gods for that. Um, so uh, I saw that there was a couple of first timers that appeared um, so we're watching old educational films. Uh, I collect old 16 millimeter film, and we watch them on this machine, which is called a telecine. Uh, so I asked people what they wanted to see, and uh, not a lot of love for uh, Petrox. Not a lot of love. Maybe we'll do a, a petroleum additive show where it's just additives to gas and not gas itself, which means I have to buy. I think I actually have two films that are petroleum additive films. They're not very interesting. Petrox, I think, is... Uh, I can't even remember. I've, I've seen it, but I, it's not sticking in my head. It's, it's definitely no um, Atlantic Imperial gas uh, promo. Um, so anyways, everybody went with uh, Inside the Big E. That was the big vote. Um, so awesome. It was a good choice. It's, uh, I think it's another uh, American Petroleum Film Institute film. Um, and it is about uh, how oil is still used and petroleum is still used on an atomic um, uh, aircraft carrier, the Enterprise. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, before we get started with this, I should say that our next screening, um, wow, actually, it still works. I'm not for sure something has broken there. Anyways, uh, the next one is May 19th, and we're going to show Jobs for Girls, and it's going to be, um, this, these films can piss people off, women off especially, because, uh, one, all women are called girls. Uh, and two, uh, it is outrageous. Um, so the idea is that, you know, when women got out of high school or out of uh, junior college, they would get jobs. Uh, but really, they were just getting jobs in, until they got married, and then they were homemakers. Um, and so this fil these films uh, were made for that. And then, you know, those, those were in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, but then in the 70s, then it's like, well, no, women... Women want careers, and they, we start calling them women. Uh, so I'll be showing a variety of those films. Um, and you get to see what girls and women can do. Um, yeah. Anyways, so uh, this is Inside the Big E. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for uh, hanging out and not watching Game of Thrones. Um, but, you know, maybe you were like, oh, crap, Game of Thrones is on. Uh, and I should also say that on uh, Facebook, the person I was talking about, I summoned her, uh, Melissa Dahlman. Uh, she was working on Carol Lane. And maybe she can. Maybe she has a link to the project she's working on about Carol Lane, uh, Shell Oil's travel consultant. Um, what a coincidence. Okay, so here is Inside the Big E. Enjoy. Is the Big E, the Enterprise, 
the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the largest ship in the world, displacement of over 85,000 tons, 230 miles of pipe, 625 miles of electrical cable, 1 million electronic tubes and transistors. Yes, the Big E is aptly named. It's been called, and rightly so, a floating city. Like most large cities, it has its own airport, its own metal and woodworking shops, offices, electrical repair shops, trucks and vehicles of all kinds, cranes to handle the big chores, elevators to speed the flow of materials, winches to put muscle into the lines, and its own post office, hospital, newspaper plant, and even its own TV studio. It has laundry men, tailors, cobblers, dentists, storekeepers, barbers, bakers, cooks, and of course a police force all its own. At sea, when men are working round the clock, the mess lines are open 19 hours a day. There are two galleys, one fore, one aft to handle the job of feeding 4,600 enlisted men and officers over 14,000 meals daily. Practically, the entire ship is air conditioned. Each bunk, in fact, has its own adjustable air conditioning outlet. Yes, whatever the folks back on land have, the Big E has too, including machines. Machines of many different shapes, many different sizes, for many and varied purposes. And here on the Enterprise, many machines float in their own sea, a sea of lubricating oil as important to the machine as the ocean is to the ship. Without lubricants, no machine can run. Lubricating oil means life to the Big E, even as it does to the countless machines Americans depend on ashore. What exactly does lubricating oil do? Basically, lubricating oil prevents gears, wheels, and other mechanical moving parts from coming into contact. Yet it allows the transmission of energy from one part to another. Oil smooths the way for massive pistons or delicate springs. When it is made into grease, it protects rods and gears. As a coolant, it prevents these tools from burning up. When blended with other substances, it can literally perform a thousand different tasks. But basically, its function is to minimize friction. With the arrival of nuclear power, a new dimension was added to the problem of lubrication. For example, aboard the Enterprise, deep in the hull, Behind protective barriers lie the nuclear reactors which can drive this giant carrier around the world many times without refueling. Ships with such prolonged operating potential must be free from the possible by the oils and greases that coat the Enterprise's various propulsion units, especially engineered for ships at sea. The Enterprise, which represents the latest technological advances in propulsion plants, uses these time-tested and proven lubricants. In addition, another nuclear-powered vessel designed for commercial application, the NS Savannah, served as a floating laboratory for the testing of the petroleum industry's lubricating oils. Besides this testing aboard the Savannah under operating conditions, one of the world's largest research laboratories, owned by an oil company, conducted further tests and screening of the many and varied lubricants required for nuclear applications. One such test was the exposing of oils to the gamma waves of cobalt-60, 
to determine their stability under any unforeseen exposure to radiation. In each test, the aim was to select the best lubricant for the job. Inside the radiation room, various samples are spread around a raised ring to be exposed to doses of radiation. A door five feet thick seals off the radiation room. When all is secure, a button is pressed and hollow steel pencils filled with cobalt 60 appear to expose the oil to powerful doses of gamma rays. A door is closed to safeguard the 42 inches of special protective glass. The tests continue for months to screen out unsuitable lubricants. Once the screening tests are passed, the most versatile lubricants with the best records of performance in industry are chosen. Additives in lubricating oil, though a comparatively new technique in lubricating, are finding increasing uses all the time. These chemicals, which prevent rust, bolster viscosity, and do dozens of other internal chores, have materially contributed to the successful conquest of wear and oxidation, which helps not only to make our nuclear-powered ships go, but also to act as a continuing indispensable factor in the operation of all our ships in the fleet. In most phases of activity in which atomic energy may someday play a part, lubricants will keep the machines moving. This is the oil which now coats the gears of the main propulsion unit. Yes, oil makes the enterprise go in a thousand ways. To see just what it means to this ship, let's live with the crew of the Enterprise for a day at sea. It is a few minutes after dawn, somewhere in the Atlantic. Here on the bridge, men are on watch. On the mast above, radar is probing the distant sky. Out on the flight deck, the jet planes are poised to catapult into a new day's operations. The bombers can be accelerated into the air from a standing start at the rate of one every 15 seconds using the ship's four catapults. It is here that lubricating oil faces another real challenge. At speeds approaching sound, the jet engines heat up rapidly. The oil must not fail in this furnace-like temperature. High engine speeds heat and thin the oil. Intensive oil industry research has ensured that this oil will continue to function at peak efficiency even under the most severe operating conditions. Petroleum research has developed lubricants that maintain a tough lubricating film at these high temperatures. Operating throughout the day, these thirsty jets require a lot of fuel. Spaces in the Enterprise, which would normally carry boiler fuel, have been converted for jet fuel, extending her capacity and thereby increasing the operating capability of the... While some jets continue to fly, 
Others require maintenance. This giant of the sea carries over 100 different kinds of lube oil for her multi-purpose operations each with its own especially engineered composition. The Enterprise's extra capacity for fuel below decks makes her the largest floating service station in existence. Carrying oil for fueling her escort ships permits extended fleet operations at sea without shore support and greater mobility and flexibility than ever before known to fleet commanders. This independence pays off in a completely self-sustaining air base an optimum weapon system for deterrence of limited war anywhere in the world. Up on the bridge, the captain awaits the return of the last aircraft. And here they come. Touchdown at 150 miles an hour, slamming into the arresting cable, then on to the elevators within seconds to be whisked below and secured on the hangar deck. Now the day is over. Time to relax and rest. These men of the Navy and these scientists of the oil industry, though they may never meet, are partners. For it is only research, painstaking, never-ending research, that makes mechanical miracles like the Enterprise a reality. This, then, is the Big E, one of the truly great scientific accomplishments of modern times a powerful instrument for the defense of the United States. A testimony to the wonders of the technology of modern industry applied to our nuclear age. A seagoing metropolis carrying the American flag around the world. So this film, um, obviously, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure that it was made like, oh crap, there's um, nuclear reactors and you have this giant um, machine that's running on, uh, it's not running on petroleum, diesel. Oh God, what if everybody does that? What if everybody goes... Uh, for uh, uh, nuclear plants and I'm sure that this was like no we'll make this and see like even though they're using atomic energy to power this thing look at all the things that use petroleum on it it's petroleum is not going away please do not go and and divest from your petroleum stocks we're okay I swear so that's I love pieces like that all right, um, so a couple of people were like, well, why don't you show both films? And sure, so why don't I show both films? I'll, I'll do it. How about that? Um, you know, uh, thanks everybody for coming out, and we'll just kind of go out on uh, Petrox, A Miracle of Petroleum. Um, again, I can't remember <laughs> how this film is. I remember there being some really beautiful shots in it, but I don't remember anything about it beyond it's a gas additive. So, yes. I mean, I'm not going to do a gas additive show. When else would I show this film? Let's just go ahead and show it. Why not? Um, you know, it's not like I have to stop at 10 o'clock. It's not like it's broadcast television or, you know. So we're just going to watch it. How about that? Thank you um, for suggesting that and me being like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I can show this other one. Um, so the next show I'm doing, May 19th, um, is... 
jobs for girls. Um, so really, girls can work. Uh, here's some jobs. Here's some films about that. Um, wonderfully insulting. I've shown films that I'm thinking of showing that have always elicited amazing responses. So um, check that one out. So Petrox. Miracle of Petroleum. Again, I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, yeah, if you like what you saw, again, spread the word about AV Geeks. I think I'm going to actually start doing some tours uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, definitely going to go to Richmond sometime <coughs> in the spring, late spring, uh, early summer, or somewhere in there. And I just got a minivan, which I have dubbed the AV RV. So I'm going to hit the road and maybe come to your town. Probably not. But yeah, I'm itching to show some 16 millimeter. And i um, actually going to be doing a show next uh, Saturday uh, at the Duke Coffee House in Durham, which I have is one of the first places I actually did a show back in the day. Uh, so we're going to do that. Uh, I have a screening at the Alamo Draft House in Raleigh uh, in May. Um, those naughty boys, because people love watching boys in the city behave. And then at King's in June, those naughty girls. So, um, you know, if you can think of a place you'd love me to come and show films and, you know, actually bring the projector and show the films, not this telecine, but actually like a real 16 millimeter projector, um, just let me know. Reach out, avgeeks at gmail.com. All right. S maybe two of you asked for this <laughs> out of everybody. Um, this is Petrox, uh, Miracle. Of petroleum. Um, everybody have a good rest of the week, um, and we will see you soon. Bye. Enjoy. Just about a year ago now that Texaco announced the new Sky Chief supercharged with Petrox. Do you remember what we said? We honestly believe that top octane Sky Chief supercharged with Petrox is the biggest thing that has hit the industry in a long, long time. It is the only such additive being used by any oil company. The fact that it is derived entirely from petroleum is important because it doesn't contain anything that can leave harmful engine deposits. Its performance has been spectacular, and I predict that you're going to be surprised at the enthusiastic reports you get from your customers when they start using it. The many letters we received prove Mr. Barrett was right about your customers. After switching to Texaco Sky Chief with Petrox, I've increased my gasoline mileage by 15 to 20 miles per tank fill. Since the new Sky Chief with Petrox came out, I have used it almost entirely, and it has eliminated the knock completely. My car has better starting, better mileage, and above all, more pep. I can feel the difference. Hundreds of such letters have come in from enthusiastic customers, and Petrox is proving to be more of a miracle additive than even we had thought it to be. But the biggest story of all, the revolutionary story of what Petrox does, is an engine life. Remember the story of Ponte de Leon? He was the Spanish dandy who lived back in the 1500s. Ponce didn't like the idea of growing old any better than the rest of us do. He had heard about a wonderful fountain of youth whose waters made old men feel young again. And Ponce had said, that's for me. So he set sail for America, determined to find the magic fountain that would turn back the years. But alas, instead of the fountain of youth, all Ponce found was Florida. So he 
sailed back to Spain, dreaming of the days of his youth. And ever since then, a lot of people like Ponce have been looking for a way to beat the years. It's tantalizing, too, because science has done a swell job of lengthening the life of a lot of other things. Take baby carriages. Or take automobiles. Antique cars are quite a hobby these days. People get a big kick out of shining up old Delahays and Riggles and Mercers and parading them down Main Street. You even hear some of them say, they don't make them like this anymore. And they're right, too. We sure don't make them like that anymore. We make them a whole lot better. Back in 1925, the life expectancy of a new car was 25,000 miles. That's once around the world. Today, a new car can expect to keep going almost indefinitely, thanks to better design, better materials, better workmanship, and most important, to good lubricants and fuels. Ah, but there's a catch in this longer life statistic. The catch is this. As old Ponte de Leon would have agreed, what's the use of living to be a hundred if you're going to feel like a hundred? And what's the use of having a car last for years if, after the first few thousand miles, it loses its zip, drives like an old jalopy, and burns gasoline like a modern airliner? Mexico has been working for years on the problem of engines that grow old before their time. The heart of the problem lies at the heart of the engine, the combustion chambers. This is where power begins. And as the car ages, this is where power is lost and fuel consumption goes up. There is no mystery about it. Combustion deposits and wear have always been the two major causes. Deposits on valves, for instance, make them stick keep them from seating properly, and compression is lost. Wear on the piston ring spoils a tight seal, and again, compression is lost. And compression is power. Now, for the first time in automobile history, something revolutionary has been done about these two engine killers. That something is Petrox, the all-petroleum additive. Petrox does some remarkable things when added to gasoline. Sky Chief gasoline, for instance, leaves a thin film of Petrox on every surface it touches. The fuel tank, the fuel line, the carburetor, and most important, the inside of the cylinder. That film may be only two or three molecules thick, but it has a spectacular effect in reducing wear. A second big point about Petrox can be demonstrated in this way. Let's burn some. After all, that's what happens in a cylinder. It burns. Because Petrox is all petroleum and contains no metallic substance, it burns completely. There is no residue to build up on valves and valve stems and in the combustion chamber. But Petrox has a further chemical action that is important. It has a tendency to prevent certain ingredients of the base gasoline, such as tetraethyl lead, from leaving deposits in the combustion chamber. All of these characteristics of Petrox are having an amazing effect on engine life. The first hint of the change came when Texaco road-tested Petrox in comparison with major competitive premium gasolines, containing other types of additives. As the cars piled up mileage on identical runs, the efficiency of each car was plotted. And after the first few miles, an amazing thing happened. The cars using major competitive premium gasolines followed the normal aging curve. Miles per gallon dropped, along with power, pickup, and general performance. The thing that threw the scientists for a loop was the performance of the cars using Petrox. For the first 25,000 miles, their fuel economy, power, and zip actually improved. 
and at 50,000 miles, their efficiency was still as good as when they started. Somewhere, they seem to have found the fountain of youth. The story of these lifelines is one of the most exciting in automobile history. In many road tests, a study of the engine parts has given the reason for this long life. For example, here are some intake manifolds from cars run the same number of miles. This one used a major competitor's premium gasoline. This one used Petrox. The cleaning action of Petrox is striking. Let's look at some valve ports from identical engines. Notice the deposits left by a major competitor's premium gasoline containing their additive. This engine used Petrox. A look at some intake valves is revealing. The three sets were from identical engines in a 20,000 mile test. The two sets to the right used major competitive premium gasolines. The set to the left used Petrox. Here are some combustion chambers showing deposit buildup. These used a major competitor's premium gasoline. These used Petrox. These three identical sets of pistons ran 20,000 miles. The set on the right used Petrox. The two sets on the left used major competitors' premium gasolines containing their additives. The spark plug at the left used Petrox. The plug at the right used a major competitor's gasoline. Using Petrox, spark plug life and efficiency increased more than 300%. We thought we had reduced wear on piston rings all that was possible with Haviland motor oil. But Petrox has cut wear even more drastically. All of these comparisons explain why Petrox keeps a car young twice as long. But what does that mean to the owner? It means just this. He can save as much as two gallons in a 20-gallon tank full of gasoline. It explains such letters as this one. Before the new gasoline came out, I used to get 15 and a half miles per gallon. Now my average mileage has come up to 17.8. And at 50,000 miles, he can still brag about that jackrabbit under the hood. But how about cars that are already old when they start using Petrox? Well, it would be foolish to say that Petrox can put back the metal already worn off the engine but it will stop that wear in its tracks. It will stop those deposits from building up anymore. It can get rid of some of those deposits. So we come to the $64 question. What is Petrox? Petrox is a complex polymolecular petrochemical synthesized by catalytic and pyrolytic reformation, polymerization, and combination of isomeric substituted, uh, cyclic, aliphatic, and paraffinic hydrocarbons. That's just our way of saying that Petrox is a secret, and we have no intention of giving it away to your competitors. No, we may not have found the fountain of youth Ponce de Leon was looking for so he could stay young, but we definitely found something that will make car engines stay young. That something is Petrox the Miracle Petroleum Additive. It gives you the best first team in the industry. The best gasoline as well as the best motor oil. For you get all around performance from advanced custom made Haviland that no other motor oil can deliver regardless of price. And this first team is yours exclusively to tell your customers about, to tell your neighbors about. And if you tell them, You'll sell them. Thanks, everybody. 
See you again very soon, if not next month.